In April of 2008, I was driving from Panama to Costa Rica, where I was living at the time, catching up on my podcasts. One of my favorites is Science Friday, which covers a variety of topics through guest interviews. The guest on this particular segment was talking about using charcoal as fertilizer. He called it biochar, and he said it all help, also helps in the fight against climate change. Now, I know what fertilizer is, and charcoal is not. And I know a little bit about climate change, too, and was mystified by what charcoal might have to do with it. I first learned about the threat of global warming 40 years ago as a student in the environmental studies program. I went on to do graduate work in botany where I learned, among other things, what fertilizer is. Now, I'd long since left the world of academia up behind, but it left me with a lifelong commitment to science literacy and a deep concern for the environment. Inspired by the work of scientist activists like James Hansen and Tim Flannery, I felt motivated to do something about humanity's looming sustainability crisis. But what? At the next opportunity, I googled this thing called biochar, and my life has not been the same since. While not a fertilizer per se, char improves fertility in ways not previously appreciated and it persists in the soil, sequestering carbon in the fight against climate change. Best of all, you make biochar by building things and burning stuff, which to me sounded like a good time. By complete serendipity, a philanthropic funded biochar project was getting underway in Costa Rica. So I inserted myself into the circle of participants as a volunteer and quickly found myself linked into a global community of scientists, sustainability advocates, and entrepreneurs, all dedicated to investigating and promoting this fresh new idea called biochar. Now, we all know about charcoal from the grill. A more refined version known as activated charcoal is in your home water filter and is also used in industry. Now, while charcoal is technically made from wood, biochar can be made from most any form of biomass. When these materials are heated in an oxygen-starved environment, they thermally decompose into combustible gases, tars and oil, and the solid residue we call biochar. The process is known as pyrolysis, and it's broadly scalable. Char-producing cook stoves save fuel and reduce emissions while increasing harvests and prosperity for subsistence farmers. Megawatt-scale grid-connected biomass plants can be profitable in today's electric generating markets. And this is one of my favorites, a multi-stage process that transforms raw biomass directly into liquid fuels to power the transportation fleets of our future and their first pilot plant is operational today. What all these technologies have in common is they produce copious amounts of biochar. Now, making charcoal is one of the most ancient of the industrial arts, and pyrolyzing organic debris for energy is not new either. Figuring out that you can use the granular waste from these processes to enrich soils while combating climate change, that's what's new. Or maybe not so new, and therein lies a story. In 1541, Francisco Pizarro, having conquered the Incan Empire, sent a group of soldiers to explore the other side of the Andes. The expedition met with mishaps, but Francisco de Orellana led a band of survivors on a two-year odyssey down the Amazon River, eventually returning to Spain, where he told the royal court of fabulous cities, of fertile fields, and of healthy natives who enjoyed a diverse diet, and from whose bounty he was able to lead his countrymen safely home. The next expedition to explore that vastness didn't set out for nearly 20 years and found only jungle, none of the civilization they expected. Oriana, meanwhile, had fallen from favor with the crown, and so his account was soon forgotten. A handful of discoveries from diverse disciplines has changed this view, and I hope you find the revelations as fascinating as I do. Funerary urns and decorated pottery are uncovered by archaeologists. Soil scientists find deep deposits containing pottery shards and fish bones and lots of charcoal. Known locally as terra preta, these dark earths are prized for their fertility. 
And perhaps most striking, a geographer flying across the interior detects large-scale geometric tracings on the recently logged landscape below, vestiges of cities and highways. Anthropologists these days now describe Amazonia at the time of contact as the scene of a thriving civilization. Cities featuring massive earthworks were linked to satellite settlements surrounded by fertile fields of char-rich terra preta soils. Inhabitants numbering in the millions lived sustainable agrarian lives here. Ordiana had spoken truly, but diseases borne by his own men for which the native immune systems had no resistance decimated the population and the jungle erased their traces. Who knew? Today, as tropical forest is peeled back and planted to petrochemical intensive monocultures, sites of terra preta soil up to two meters deep are detected, still fertile hundreds of years after they were first created. What did the natives know that the colonists didn't and that their contemporaries still haven't figured out? A little bit of biology may help explain. Plants pull off what is arguably life's most impressive magic trick. From thin air, in plain daylight, they increase in mass by sipping a bit of water and exhaling pure oxygen. The sleight of hand for this trick is the scantling of mineral nutrients plants pinch from the soil. No minerals, no magic. And chief among these is nitrogen. The most abundant gas in our atmosphere, nitrogen is stubbornly stable. Plants can't crack it. From the dawn of agriculture, farmers have relied upon manures. That started changing about 100 years ago with the invention of a process for making nitrogen fertilizer using natural gas. Whether of chemical or organic origin, fertilizer is just a blend of those mineral nutrients that plants require in order to grow. Fertility, on the other hand, is not so easily defined. It's a little bit like pornography. Or in the words of Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart, I know it when I see it. Fertility is an emergent property of complex interacting physical and biotic factors. Fertile soils hold water while allowing for drainage. They make nutrients available while preventing their leaching. Fertile soils contain lots of organic matter in various stages of decay and they're teeming with microbes. A spoonful may contain billions, all down there eating and excreting and dividing and dying and cycling nutrients that plants can absorb. The hapless colonists who first farmed the jungle use slash and burn, a technique which works well enough in the temperate zone, but in the humid tropics, biology is on hyperdrive and competition for nutrients so intense that organic debris is quickly recycled back into the canopy. The ashes provide a shot of nutrients that quickly get leached because there's no organic matter in the soil to hold them. Biochar can serve as a surrogate for natural organic matter. Its highly porous structure provides habitat for microbes and it has a weakly negative surface charge so that nutrients cling to it like a magnet and its stable carbon structure resists decay, so biochar soils are persistently fertile. Biochar improves the productivity of agriculture, especially in areas of low rainfall or in nutrient-poor soils. And in addition to sequestering carbon, biochar also suppresses emissions of nitrous oxide and methane, potent greenhouse gases that are generated by agricultural soils. Beyond agriculture, Biochar's dual properties of filtration and supporting biology make it a powerful tool for a variety of other environmental challenges. So here's the big idea. Practice massively on a global scale, relying primarily on waste biomass without displacing food crops, without impacting natural areas, and accounting for directly sequestered carbon, avoided agricultural emissions, and displaced fossil fuel use, biochar can offset 12% of human greenhouse gas production. 
And biochar is one of many technologies in renewable energy and other areas capable of comparable or even greater emissions reductions with the potential to completely decarbonize our economy. All these ideas are scientifically proven, technically feasible, and many of them are in practice today. This curve may look familiar. It records the steady climb of CO2 concentrations in our atmosphere. Now, if we think of this chart as civilization's climate change report card, we'll get a good grade when the curve starts coming back down. The thing is, even if we stop burning fossil fuels today, and so far we've yet to even slow down, all we'll succeed in doing is arresting the upward trend of this curve. Curtailing greenhouse gas emissions alone will not be enough to put the carbon genie back in the bottle. But biochar is different. In addition to avoiding emissions, biochar sequesters carbon in the soil, removing it from the atmosphere. We call this carbon negative, and carbon negative is planet positive. Biochar is among a handful of carbon negative agricultural strategies that actually restore natural ecosystem properties. Industrial agriculture has been phenomenally successful in providing us with cheap, abundant food, but is totally dependent upon petrochemicals. And we're all paying the price in the form of eroded soils, polluted waterways, oceanic dead zones, and other externalities that pile on to the global triple threat of biodiversity loss, desertification, and climate change. The soil holds the key. The Earth's soils contain more carbon than the atmosphere and terrestrial ecosystems combined, yet we're losing them at a rate approaching 100 billion tons a year. It can take a thousand years to form a single inch of topsoil in nature. Biochar and related agricultural practices jumpstart soil formation. By globally adopting these soil building strategies, along with the technologies to wean us off fossil fuels, we can put the carbon genie back in the bottle.